for inspiring people. Uh, uh, Ryan Anthony from Flux Space um, in the United States, in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I thought I went blank there, Ryan. <laughs> So Ryan, welcome. Ryan will be showing us his very, very innovative space. Um, I'll, I'll come back to Ryan as I introduce him before he chats. And we've got Karin Stain from the Mandela, uh, Nas Mandela University um, on behalf of the Math Art Competition here to inspire us today. So thank you for the both of you being here today and for being our guest of honor. Uh, let me just move my, so just to alert you to different things on, uh, on our platform. You'll be using the Zoom platform, obviously, just to show you the, on the left, on the, in the middle is the chat um, feature. Please use the chat feature if you want to communicate and, uh, and just pop a message in the chat. Uh, then also just to um, show you the reactions button on the right hand side, please make use of that. That's how we would like you to interact with our, um, our little webinar today. Please use your emoji, show us how you're feeling, how you, what you're thinking, what you're wondering. Um, some nice emojis that have been added there. So it's not just thumbs up and claps. You can click on the little three dots there on the right hand side and uh, show us really how you're feeling. Um, I love emojis. Uh, it's probably a, a, another language all on its own because it's just so expressive and it's so great to use uh, from little right up to old all these, um, so use your reactions, show us how you're feeling. Um, so how are you feeling today? Pop it in the chat box. How are you feeling? Are you tired? Are you irritable? Are you happy? Are you blah? How are you feeling today? Pop it in the chat box. And while you're doing that, I thought that there were a couple of, when I was looking through emojis, how am I feeling? There's just such, such cute little emojis that have, are coming out all the time and they're just so expressive. I mean, the eyebrow raise, I mean, really. <laughs> uh, I love the one with the little, the, the eyeballs going a little bit crazy. That's a new one. I haven't seen that one. That's quite a new one, I think. On, on the menu, which is very expressive. I often feel like that. So yeah, wonderful. I love the emojis. Okay, so launching off just to introduce you to our first speaker today, uh, Ryan Anthony. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a background about Ryan. Uh, he's a former grade eight science teacher, a tech ed tech coach. He's passionate about creating innovative learning spaces and experiences that take place in them. He's currently serving as the director of innovation at Flux. He helps schools design, create and utilize innovative spaces that spark creativity, curiosity and collaboration. He's an experienced educator has a passion for effectively integrating technology. Can I carry on, Ryan? <laughs> He's a strong believer in cooperative learning, hands-on engagement, project-based learning, critical thinking, and using creative ways to engage students. He's a dynamic leader. He's able to bring energy and enthusiasm to motivate individuals to reach their potential. Um, I was looking, uh, searching for inspiration on the internet um, for makerspace ideas. And this is, the, Ryan is who I came across and uh, connected Great. with me face, virtually face to face. Uh, immediately, he's, he's keen to share ideas. Thank you, Ryan, for being my inspiration. And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to inspire others 
in our community today. So Ryan, I'm going to hand over to you. Welcome. Wow. Uh, thank you. That was a uh, an awesome introduction. I Yeah, that w- wasn't expecting that, but that's uh, flattering. So I appreciate it and uh, really appreciate the opportunity um, to kind of meet with you guys on this platform. Um, I'm, I'm coming from all the way from Pennsylvania. So we're, we're close to Philadelphia and I'm going to pull up my screen here. Now I had the share settings and I'm going to flip around a little bit um, and I'm actually going to walk around too. So hopefully that doesn't make you guys too sick or dizzy, but can you guys see my screens? Thumbs up, uh, I guess is a good, if, if you can see it, yes. I like the emojis, which is cool. All right. Awesome. Good. Uh, so yeah, my name is Ryan Anthony. Um, I'm a former, I shared a really awesome job, kind of given my background, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But in short, um, I'm a, a former 10th or 8th grade science teacher. I did that for about 10 years. And I really got into maker spaces and STEM programs. And I really got hooked on figuring out these kind of non-traditional ways of engaging students. Um, and I realized that I love teaching. I love students. I loved allowing them to find their passions and set up and create these really cool opportunities for them to experience uh, learning. And that was through STEM education. And I think I came to a point um, probably about four years ago where, where I just got real frustrated with school. Um, so long story short, I always had a vision of dream of finding a very large warehouse um, and just fill it with everything innovative. Uh, a process that I went through is I was tasked with creating a makerspace at my old district and making decisions on what that should look like and what classes could use it, what equipment should go into it was very daunting and challenging. And I always thought like, man, if only I had a building where I could go and just test and see things that a group of people believe that would be create a better learning experience for students, um, that would be great. But also that building could be used for community events and we could have student groups in to kind of pilot. So what I'm getting at is eventually uh, what we created, which we call Flux Space or or Flux for short. And the idea of what we do, and I'll kind of go through um, some pictures here real quick, is we're basically helping organizations create innovative learning environments, experiences and programs. Um, So usually when we have these meetings, I walk people around our facility. So I'm going to try to show you a little bit of it without making you like really sick. So hopefully we're not going to stir up any motion sickness, but just to give you an idea of uh, the work that we're in and what we do. And and here's a picture of the area before it was done. Uh, We did a big community event, but I'm going to try to hold it up. And I don't know if I can go full screen or again, sorry if it gets too crazy, but what we basically have is a, is a 10,000 square foot warehouse that is sectioned off by different areas. And in each area, Uh, is a way for educators to kind of learn more about that area of STEM or get really excited about what learning could be. Um, And as schools and organizations are designing new spaces or looking for new STEM programs, they know this is a safe place to come experiment and play with it. Um, So for example, we have our uh, makerspace area. It's kind of under construction, which is kind of ironic, but it's always under construction. We're always moving around and getting new equipment. Uh, We realized we were running out of space really quickly. So Uh, This is going to be more a uh, third through eighth grade kind of STEM lab. So things like Makey Makey and Strawbies and Sam Labs, those are some really cool platforms and programs that we get excited about that we use with our students. Um, The other area that I want to show you guys is we have a pretty cool, we're playing around with hydroponics and indoor farming. Um, So we have vertical garden setups here behind me. Uh, But the one thing that's been really exciting is this system called uh, Fork Farms. So the idea is this unit allows you to do hydroponics anywhere. Uh, There's no plumbing going in or out. We're growing uh, basil on the left and romaine lettuce on the right, uh, which is pretty awesome. So again, just a a system, hey, what could STEM look like? What is a really cool learning experience for my students um, that I could bring back to my school? That's not going to be hard to do. That's not going to be intimidating. Um, So this is our area that we're getting into it with hydroponics. Uh, We have a large kind of cooking culinary art spot. So if uh, students or the community want to explore cooking and take a class or a workshop, we're always looking for those partners um, that can help celebrate uh, making and creating. And I think part of the part of the idea, too, is helping students kind of find a career or, you know, rather develop those passions and find a purpose, because if they have a purpose, they understand why school is school and what they need to do to live that out. We'll talk a lot about that a little bit more later. 
Um, but this is pretty cool. It's our large group meeting area. So we have a very large uh, LED video wall, which is awesome. Um, we got some more collaboration, flexible areas where people can spread out. And I don't, I've never done this through a video call. So this is a little experiment. Um, but I want to take you in this. And I don't know if this is going to work out or not. Uh, but this is called Igloo. Brian? Yeah. Um, can you just stop sharing your screen so that your video um, takes the yeah. focus? Uh -huh. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know. So here is, uh, we call this our immersive learning environment. So this is a system called Igloo Vision. So the idea is students can get this really cool immersive uh, VR. Sorry, Ryan, we still can't see your, uh, oh. your camera. Your... Can you see me now? Just click on um, the... Um, we yeah, can. Just click. People oh, need yeah. to pin him to their... People need to click on his thing and pin him. If you pin him, you'll see him uh, showing. Yeah. Or if you click on view on the top right of your screen, it asks you for gallery or speaker view, and then it should put you on to the of That's it. It's okay. We got a lot of, we good now? Yeah. All That's right. Good. So yeah, so this is one of um, an area that we're, that we're playing around with. It's called uh, Igloo Vision, and the whole idea is about VR, but without students wearing the goggles, this is more of a shared experience. So it's called Share VR. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the technology, but there's projectors up there and it's called projection mapping. And what it's basically doing is taking that signal and putting it into a 360 room. Um, so wherever I look around this dome uh, is the experience. So any 360 content, um, you know, renderings, the whole idea about VR and AR growing, um, you know, VR today, when students are wearing headsets, is very individualized. It's not really a shared experience. Um, we found that a lot more people get motion sickness wearing the goggles or they don't want to mess up their hair or the germs that are on it. Um, so this allows to have more of a shared immersive learning environment. Uh, and some installs at schools are uh, they're taking old computer labs and putting systems like this in and the class can actually go down and sit on the floor. And then all of a sudden you could take students anywhere in the world, they can relive any 360 content. Um, and the idea is that, you know, we always ask educators and what we do is we experiment with this is saying, you know, is this worth schools to invest in? Is the learning opportunity really going to be there? And the idea is that, you know, one ELA teacher said, well, we have students right about the beach, but I have many students that have never been to the beach or how do we bring uh, this content to life or that content to life? So it really allows you to kind of live in this immersive experience, which is really cool. So um, it's a lot better in person, trust me. But yeah, so just the program that, that we're playing around with. Um, and I'll kind of give a quick, you know, for those that didn't see before, here's the uh, kind of a larger group collaboration area. Uh, so we'll hold workshops and events and we invite school districts and other organizations to come out, have a retreat, have a day. Uh, we'll do some team building exercises with them. Again, at the whole time, experimenting with our own programs and lessons that we think would create better learning experiences for students. Uh, and then educators are able to bring that back, um, which is really cool. So this is about 10,000 square feet. Um, and for sake of time, I'm not going to do it, but there's a bridge that kind of goes over and there's another 100,000 square feet. Uh, we're part of a larger organization called Corbett Inc. Um, and the president, Bill Corbett, uh, owns about 100,000 square feet of warehouse. And he was looking to do something innovative with it. And it was pretty cool partnership that we have in terms of flux space, focusing on uh, the learning experiences, learning environments, and the parent company designs the spaces, which is cool. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I saw a question pop up. Oh, the immersive experience is a great concept. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, I'm cool. learning this. yeah go ahead. I'm going to switch into my office because some people are coming in, but uh, go ahead. Please ask a question if you have one. Um, this one from Sarah, she, she's asking, what do you do with the products that you grow from your hydroponics? Oh, so I, we consume them. I've never eaten so much lettuce in my life, uh, which is good. We, no, we have a couple, couple things. One is um, we have uh, local nonprofits that we partner with. Uh, so there's a community center that sends students to us, um, I want to say maybe every other week or, or once a month um, as school starting up now, hopefully once a week. And uh, some of the families actually take it home. So the idea is it's a really cool way to grow local produce, fresh, healthy, sustainable. We have some partners that grow it and uh, we'll donate it to a food bank. 
Uh, so the idea of it not just being non-perishable items, but uh, healthy leafy greens and things like that. So yeah, we actually have a local zoo nearby too. Um, and, and there's a school that is considering partnering and growing food for the zoo, uh, which is really cool. So yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so I'm going to go back to share my screen again, and we'll, we'll kind of get into the, the talk a little bit about, um, so we should be able to switch over now. Cool. All good? Still have everybody? People, people didn't get too sick walking around? You have to make the trip. If you're ever in uh, the United States or you're ever in Pennsylvania, please stop by. We, we love to walk you around and kind of show you. Um, so yeah, so our work, I'm going to minimize my screen a little bit. So if anybody has a question or, you know, yell it out, or maybe I guess we'll do questions at the end, um, but hopefully we don't lose you. Cool. So yeah, so the whole idea again is to recap what, what we're doing is we wanted to create this really cool STEM education incubator or experience kind of center and, and just create this really cool resource and be an asset to the community and to schools and provide a safe place for teachers to come, educators to come. Uh, to really understand what STEM education could be. And, and we don't want to necessarily act like the experts. Our, our mentality is more working together with the teachers and the partners so that collaboratively we can vet and figure out what is really a good product, what is really a good program, and what this really means for learning. Um, and create this kind of system where, you know, we have internships and we engage the community and everybody's kind of learning alongside each other to figure out what could really be a better learning experience. And through that, uh, one of the big passions of ours is really trying to help students develop an idea of what career they would want uh, later on in life. Um, you know, we use the phrase, it's not so much, you know, what you want to do. It, it's more about like, you know, what you want to be, right? Or, or I should flip that. It's more of like what skills or what do you want to wake up doing every day? Um, and not so much a career or, you know, I want to be this specific engineer or I want to be an astronaut. There's just so many skills that I think students could develop that it's going to line up to, to that. So through this, um, we are uh, getting to STEM. So everybody is defining STEM a little bit differently. And, and there's sometimes people that, you know, it has to be science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, the whole idea for me is that it's, it's trying to understand how the world works and solve problems. And when we look at that, there's two main things there. Understand how the world works and to solve problems. The content part of school and what you're learning and what you need to recall is understanding how the world works to solve Solve problems is great. So the STEM education part, um, it's going to be experiences that equip students with necessary skills and confidence needed to create innovative solutions to solve complex problems. So developing individuals that can recreate innovative solutions to complex problems, this idea about creating problem solvers. And when you start to get into STEM education a little bit, I think a part that we were missing for a while um, is this idea of the work collaboratively to do these things. So in essence, STEM education for me, when I was in the classroom, uh, has moved from just being that acronym of science, tech, and engineering and math, and really moved towards this kind of movement or this idea about how do we have students working together to, to understand and to build confidence on how to solve problems, to identify problems, and then come up with these really cool solutions. Um, now, the, I get this a lot too, is, is what about the arts? What about A? And, and um, I'm, I'm a fan of STEAM. Um, I, again, I, I think a lot of time us in education, we get caught up in the acronym that we lose sight of what it could really be or, or what it was meant to be. Uh, so I have no problem adding the A in. If, if we want to call it STEM or STEAM, that's fine. Um, but I think the cool way to do it is that with the arts, in addition of the arts, it kind of allowed um, schools to understand how to take STEM a step further in terms of like STEM being the understanding the identifying problems, working collaboratively, but the arts part allows you to actually produce, create these artifacts, models, or prototypes to really communicate or test your ideas or concepts. So, you know, I don't want to leave art out by any means. I just, you know, my stance is um, I don't get upset if we call it STEM or STEAM. I did have a school reach out and they wanted to add ELA and they were calling it STEMELA. And then it was just this acronym that was like 11 letters. And at that point, uh, we probably could just call it school. So, you know, I, I think the idea is that, you know, STEM, again, is this movement, um, this idea. We call it a mindset, an experience, a process, a movement. Um, and, and I'm a big believer for all classes, all grades, all levels and all zip codes, uh, meaning that, you know, this idea um, when I was teaching in eighth grade, we had a STEM elective and it wasn't really integrated yet into curriculum. It was a separate class but it was the class only for the gifted. And it killed me because, you know, I think even more so is that students that are struggling or lowering achieving students need STEM more sometimes than the gifted kids. And I think what we're finding from 
a career readiness perspective is that STEM education experiences for the low achieving students is a pathway and a way for them to be more hands-on and, uh, and get a career that's more rewarding and something they're going to enjoy doing. I think a lot of times we get caught up in, and don't get me wrong, my, my wife's a, a third grade ELA reading teacher. So I get my hands slapped all the time sometimes when I make these comments, but I think sometimes we're forcing students to read instead of like allowing them to enjoy it. Um, you know, one of my experiences was eighth grade science. I had uh, low achieving students and, and students that really needed help with reading and they were in reading remediation programs, but they picked those reading remediation programs during more, I shouldn't say fun, but elective times. So what happens is imagine this, you have a student that loves robotics, loves hands-on coding, loves all the tinkering and making, and they have an opportunity to sign up for a class like that. But instead of taking that class, they are going to a reme reading remediation program in front of a computer. So I'm kind of you know, re reliving some of the things that I saw in as an educator. It's very complicated problems. And um, you know, I'm not really sure the answers, but we want to try to look for that. So is there a way that we could use STEM education to allow students to engage in reading and to build those skills through some of these hands-on things. And, and I think the answer is absolutely. So um, part of this, again, is getting back to we at Fluxspace believe STEM is for everyone, uh, STEAM and STEM is for everyone. It's more of a movement. It's more of a mindset. You could be an ELA reading teacher and still do STEM. Um, you know, I know some people get upset about that, where you have to have these degrees to do this or do that. And I think once we start putting regulations on that, we truly miss what learning could and should be, um, you know, with, with STEM education. So uh, I show this a lot because, again, coming from the world of education, I've run into numerous acronyms every day. And STEM, STEAM, Stramella, you know, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, PPIL, IEP, a whole bunch of them. But the whole idea of these acronyms, and I think what it does is our main goal is we want to create student-centered learning environments. And, and this is kind of, again, one of the things that we live by. It's this learning environment and experience where we're moving students from passive receivers to active participants in their own discovery process. So this idea that students no longer want to be talked to for 30 minutes or 50 minutes while sitting in rows of desks. But the idea is that how can we create these environments and experiences when we allow them to actively participate in that learning? Um, and, and that's part of, of what we're trying to work on. So this discovery process, I think, can look like a couple different things. And I, I want to hit on some and kind of show you guys some examples of, um, of what we mean by the discovery process or what are some of the things that we do here uh, with our teachers. So the idea of STEAM integration, uh, I have my content, I have this, what are ways that I can integrate STEM or STEAM? So uh, these really cool STEM tools in terms of like Makey Makey, SAM Labs, um, this idea of prototyping and making, uh, Microbits is a big hit over here, some of those programs, Edison Robots is a good one. So maybe it's retelling the story by coding my robot to reenact a, a part in it in a scene or using a makey makey to code now a live uh, interactive poster um, things like that the engineering design process so uh, design challenges we use those a lot this idea of the uh, you know here's your set of materials go ahead build what you need to for this kind of goal so you know once we do a simple tower challenge with a little bit of twist we give people random supplies um, and we say without resupplying, uh, you have to use these materials to build the tallest tower that's going to hold a ping pong ball. And that's a very introductory one. But you'd be surprised how many adults um, especially can overcomplicate that and, and learn a lot from that process. Um, all the way to then trying to create actual inventions or prototypes and this idea about engineering be a design process and let students discover um, and, and kind of discover STEM in that design process. Uh, project problem inquiry based learning, this idea about how do we have more of a unit plan um, in terms of giving students either a project that they're going to complete, a problem they're going to solve, or some kind of area that they're going to really go through and explore. Um, you know, I had a lot of PBL units right before I left the classroom, things like the mousetrap car, and students would build a mousetrap car and they would learn about kinetic and potential energy, simple machines. And the whole goal was um, to try to build a mousetrap car, mouse car that would go the furthest. So we brought in maker spaces and that whole iterative, 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 I don't know, I can't say that word right now, iterative, I don't know, I'll look it up later, but that design process. Um, and then one of the big ones that we love to do is empathy and design thinking. And I really like this last one because you can really use design thinking anywhere. It doesn't really need to be um, more of a STEM focused. Um, I, I believe it is because you have to 
understand your user, figure out what's going on and, and go from there, which is really cool. So I want to um, uh, dive in a little bit to empathy and design thinking and kind of share the story with you guys um, that we share with educators that are through here. And you might've heard this story before, um, but I want to kind of show you it. It's from IDEO, um, which is really cool. Design thinking is a process for creating problem solving. If you're in education, I'm sure you know design thinking, um, but a really cool way to bring it to the maker movement. Um, and these are the steps. I don't, I don't want to take too much time on it, but the idea is you empathize, you learn about your audience, uh, you define, you create a problem or, or brainstorm uh, the points of view, or yeah, brainstorm, come up with many creative solutions, build a representation of your ideas or prototype, and then share out your work. Um, so the prototype and test part, I think, really hits the A in STEAM, this idea about you're creating, you're building artifacts, you're making it, and you're sharing it. Um, and then the first part, being able to go through that discovery process of STEM and identifying problems and coming up with solutions. So I think the design thinking process fits really well with, with STEAM education. All right, so here's a story. Uh, it's from a book called 10 Faces of Innovation with the IDO group, and we'll see if this comes across well. So there was a group of surgeons in, um, I believe, Chicago, and they were ear, nose, throat. Uh, I think they were working on, on nasal, and they met with the IDO team. And they said, you know, we're looking for a device or tool that's going to allow us to uh, perform a better surgery in the nose area. So what they were doing is they were kind of using their hands and they were explaining to the IDO team, uh, this is what it should look like. It's got to be about this big. And they were getting a little frustrated. So one of the IDO guys had an idea and he decided to go outside in the, in the hallway and grab a bunch of random items and create a prototype. So he had an Expo marker, a film canister, and a clothespin. And it's kind of weird because usually a clothespin and a film canister, I have to explain to students what those are because uh, they haven't really seen them. Uh, so that's kind of funny. So that takes a couple of minutes to explain that. Um, but yeah, the Expo marker, a film canister, and clothespin. So he took this risk, took this chance, brought that back to the doctors and showed them. And they held it in their hands and they said, oh my gosh, this is, I think, exactly what we were talking about. It's approximately the right size. It has some of the features we were talking about. Um, and so they went through this iterative design process. They kind of made things, they tested it. And then the final product um, looked like that. So the idea is this concept that the one IDO guy, the design thinker went and kind of took a risk, right? He went out and he grabbed these materials and his clothespin and canister and marker, and he put it together and he showed these doctors and created that. And what's kind of cool about it is you can kind of see even the marker cap help control the motor speed of, of, of the uh, tool that goes up your nose, which is kind of weird to think that that could be up somebody's nose one day and, and is and performing surgeries. Um, but I think the really cool take home message here is that we need to make it culturally acceptable to show off ideas at the rough and early stages. I think a lot of times with STEM and STEAM education, we have to be very basic with it. We have to make students feel comfortable that no idea is bad, no questions are bad. And that even if you go and, and just kind of rough prototype and you're using cardboard and glue to kind of get a point across is that that's a really successful way to bring prototyping and an idea for this. Um, and the idea that these guys use that type of rough prototyping during this meeting to create a product that I don't know how much money was, but I'm sure if it was medical and it looks like that, it probably was very expensive. Um, so I share this story with, with students to say, yeah, even though you're, you're making this thing and, and maybe the, the motor doesn't work exactly, or maybe it's not electronic, maybe it's not plugged in, you still have this idea and concept that you're using rough prototyping to get your ideas across. And again, this is where the A comes in for STEM or STEAM. Um, so how can you use this? So the idea is um, we use it a couple of ways. One, we say, hey, solve a world problem, this idea about solve a problem. And it could be a very big, complicated problem, or it could be a very basic problem. So who hasn't done this? Um, you know, grocery store, you load up, uh, you know, I never want to take two trips. Who does? So the idea is you load up as many as you can on your arm. Um, but then somebody said, hey, this is a basic tool. Why don't we invent something like this? So this thing called the mighty handle. Um, there was actually a lady uh, when I was doing this talk before that she got really excited because she has a mighty handle. So she was bragging about the innovation that she has. But again, a very simple, um, you know, you think about the design thinking process for this. So somebody observed or realized that this is a problem. Uh, we're trying to use these plastic bags. We're trying to carry them inside. Somebody said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we prototype something out? And uh, now you can carry up to 50 pounds per handle using the mighty handle. So an easier way to to transport goods. 
something a little bit bigger, uh, which we want to eventually get students towards is this idea about solving real world problems. Uh, so a really great site. Not sure if you guys heard about it, but if, if you have, uh, please go check it out. It's called the Global Goals for Sustainable Development. And each of these is a goal that the UN has kind of identified as a, a world problem um, that needs help, right? Something that we need to step up and we need to kind of help solve or create these innovative solutions for. And I really like this site because when you click on one of these uh, opportunities or, or one of these numbers, it really gives you the idea of what the problem is, uh, what resources are out there, what work's already being done, what studies and things like that, and provides a really great perspective on a world problem. Uh, when I had eighth graders, it's sometimes it's hard for them to research a world problem. Sometimes the information and facts aren't great. Um, you know, sometimes they land on other political initiatives and pages and they get a little confused by it. And we go through the whole, well, you know, let's read through it and kind of make a, make an assessment on what you think. But this site does a really good idea for doing that. And what this looked like for us is uh, we did a drone day. Oop, yeah, I got, I actually went to this site. Give me one second. Uh, yep, there we go. Oh, okay. Did I go back to full screen? We can keep it there. Because I'll have to slip through something. There we go. Uh, so what we did is we made a challenge. We used uh, drones and drone technology in a platform called Sam Studio. Uh, and we had teams of students design and develop a new use for drones or drone technologies that would help solve like a world problem. Uh, so this was the Drone Day student guide, which was great. Um, another one, which is cool, is uh, Design Thinking for All Grades. So there's a book out there called Ricky the Rock That Couldn't Roll. And the idea is there's Ricky in the picture and he has a flat bottom. Uh, and the idea is Ricky cannot roll down any hills. The rest of his buddies and the rest of the rocks can roll down the hill, no problem. They see Ricky and they get a little, you know, kind of upset. So what they do is they prototype and they round out Ricky's bottom and then he can roll down the hill. Um, so just kind of showing that this idea about empathy and design thinking and, and processing doesn't have to happen just in the older grades. Um, so an invention, a tool that would help a character in a book. These, again, are ways that we could kind of use design thinking in the classroom or empathy. Uh, an invention that would have changed history and outcome an event. A shelter for a character in a book. This I have STEM, design a new playground, schoolhouse math, a chair remote. There's a lot of cool things out there. Um, students, adults with disabilities and using 3D printing to for more accessible controllers and switches and things like that is really great. Um, inventions or innovations, and then even just the idea of empathy, not, not necessarily, I mean, I think the world could use a little more empathy, but the idea of about knowing your customers, clients, or your audience, how, how can you really put yourself in their shoes and kind of understand their problem? And that's a very strong STEM skill in terms of observation, and then being able to take that information and go through it. So um, I'm going to fly through this real quick for the sake of time, but I'll try to share this out too. Uh, this is a cool kind of resource, sharpen.design. Uh, we help these guys develop it. But what you do is you, it's a STEM generating prompt tool. Uh, so when you click on it, it'll say, you know, invent a way to clean up oceans using only, you know, this or prototype an invention for a chef where he can help organize uh, cooking tools. And what it does, it just kind of gives you random design prompts that are a little bit outside of build a tower, build a bridge. It kind of creates these really cool specific things that are there. So, yep, it kind of looks like this, provide a safety tool that helps a fisherman, um, you know, other ones that kind of, you know, invent a special glass for firefighters, prototype a functioning clothing item for a nurse, um, things like that. So, yeah, so these are the steps. Um, usually we have more time or if you guys were in person, we'd go through it. But for the sake of time, I definitely want to want to move on. So I want to I want to kind of show you an example of what we're talking about with STEM education and, and the importance of it and the experience of it. Um, again, trying to have individuals that can work collaboratively to create innovative solutions to solve complex problems, you know, equipping students with these skills and confidence to create these solutions and solve complex problems. Um, so if we look, we have some online STEAM challenges. Um, and then again, I'll share this because I know we're going through it pretty quick, um, but I wanted to get to this. So we say a lot of times, you know, I use that drone example for the global goals and they're these small codable drones. And I think a lot of times what we say in education is we're preparing jobs uh, to students that don't even, don't even exist yet. Um, so what I want to show you guys is this is a company that moved in right next door. Uh, they lease about 12,000 square feet of our area and it's a company called Aslan. 
And what Aslan does is uh, it's drone AI surveillance. So it's basically robotic surveillance for, this is an example of a river port or industrial park. And um, this area holds the drone. This is the drone. And this company, Aslan 3D prints their parts. They solder, they code, they breadboard. They basically build their own drones on site. And then this is what's really cool. They build this as well. And what this is, is it's housing area. And we actually have one of these in our upper parking lot. And that's where they do prototyping and testing. But this is where the drone lives. It's housing for the drone. So imagine you're an industrial park, you're a manufacturing facility, you're a river port, someplace that needs surveillance. Um, they will have these drones on site and the drones will stay in a cabinet. And then either when there's a security breach or they need the drone to fly a mission to go check a cooling tower or something like that, the top of it will pop open and the drone pops up. So completely untouched by human hands um, after it gets set up, the drone will fly its mission and will drive around. And then when its battery gets low, it can make its way back to its home base. It lands and this whole port right here without anybody touching it can actually switch out its own battery. So this is an example of, I think, something that didn't exist five, six, seven years ago, and it has been in development. This idea that we're replacing security guards and this idea of cameras being more mobile through drone technology. Um, so again, here's a problem solving. We need to be better at surveillance. We need to be able to see things quicker um, you know, with different networks and internet and 5G coming up. Why can't we have video streams from drones? And these guys are really inventing um, security using robotics and drones. There's a video here, but I, I want to be respectful of time, but I will show you uh, this part. Um, so again, I can share the presentation if you guys want to go through some of this stuff. But so this is actually our location. These uh, warehouses here on the bottom um, is our area. And this is what their video feed will look like at a command center. So they have students, they have individuals um, that are uh, using this and flying missions. And this is the information that they get back, which is which is really cool. And I'll show you this video because there's a problem and I'm hoping, let's see if it works and comes through. So what this is, is a, a Boston Dynamic robotic dog. So what they're doing is they're developing not only as a drone surveillance, but also robotic dog surveillance. So, and actually I'll pause it real quick. So if you look in the back top, there's an area that's fenced in in our upper parking lot. Um, that is the prototype where the drone would take off and land. The problem is if drones are the only way that you're going to use surveillance, if it's really windy or really rainy, somebody's going to wait until it's bad weather to go and go through and do it. Um, so the idea now is that um, the robotic dog and the drone are basically a team. Super scary, I know. But again, being able to use this type of technology um, and this coding and this AI and giving students the ability to really see um, that this is the future of jobs. And you know, these guys are hiring kids out of high school for some positions. Usually it's a two-year program. You don't need a four-year college degree. So we're big on more of the career-ready focus rather, rather than the college focus, which is great. So I want to be respectful of time because I think I, I was given about 40 minutes. So I think I'm close and definitely leave some time for questions. Um, yeah, hope, hopefully I didn't jump around there too much. But the whole idea is that you know, we're really excited about STEM. I think it's the most, one of the most important things that schools can go through. I know I'm going to figure it out. Yep. I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, yeah, and here's our, the hydroponics, which is a whole nother part. But how do I, yep. All right. So time for questions or anybody want to ask or I'm going to open up chat because I haven't really been looking at it. Okay. Our challenges. What is the cost estimate of the investment in the equipment usable? Yeah, good question. Um, so the question about the philanthropic and the investors and things like that. So um, a, a long story short, we're actually the our division, the flux based division and the Corbett Inc. is not a nonprofit. So we're actually a for-profit company, but I say that kind of with the smile because the, the whole flux space initiative is we pretty aim to break even the parent company that I mentioned before, which is Corbin Inc was a really awesome strategic partner. Their main business is helping schools and universities and offices redesign spaces. So what they do is they design furniture implementation and then sell the furniture uh, to put into those spaces. So for me, for the idea of flux spaces, we were thinking about a maker space or is it a nonprofit? Is it not? Um, but when I met the president of Corbett Inc., Bill Corbett, 
we said, hey, why don't we really focus on, on the learning environment um, and this idea about what the learning experience should be? And Bill Corbett, his thought was, you know, learning space is so much more than furniture. It's got to be the experience in the environment. So it just kind of really made sense for us to join forces. So FlexSpace is a branch of it. What's really cool is that gives us the opportunity to let any nonprofit use our space and use our resources and use our assets because that lets us test equipment, get exposure and kind of help build the program. So it's been a really cool partnership. So I get it. It's, it's a real tough thing in, in terms of finding uh, investors and, and things like that in terms of the philanthropic and grant funding and working with the government. Our approach was let's really focus on being a physical building with all the tools and assets and just let any partner come and use it. Um, so I don't know if we... We dream up a flux space out in South Africa, <laughs> but I don't, uh, you know, that it's very tough. Um, so we're, we're starting to do STEM events on Saturdays, which we're charging the community we're, for a little bit. And the idea with that is we want to be able to break even on um, paying high school interns. And again, having this place allow individuals to really experience what careers could be and, and allow them to get paid internships for that. So we're working on some of those programs. Um, but if it wasn't for the parent company, Corbin Inc., and their idea about creating these really cool uh, uh, learning environments and not so much just from furniture, but the technology and the experiences and the culture and the mindset that should go in it, um, I, don't, I don't think Fluxspace would, would be here today. It definitely wouldn't be here today. So yeah, I don't unpackage that a little bit, but I, hopefully that answered your question. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. In, in the lead? I'm horrible with names. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ryan, and yeah. Andile Konsa, he's our CEO of Pinwich, so welcome. Andy. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. Yeah, no, it's been uh, it's been great. I think Cheryl and I even had some talks about what that could be, and if we can help you guys out um, ways, definitely. Um, yeah, if you got this space, it'd be, it'd be cool to figure out ways to partner. And uh, we're building out a new website with a bunch of resources. And our whole goal is to not replace anybody. Um, it's more uh, celebrate everything that's good, right? If, if you're an organization, a partnership, a company, a STEM company, and, and your true passion is to try to create better learning experiences for students and really help them enjoy learning um, and get excited about going to school and get them excited about what their future could be, we're, we're game for partnership. So, yeah. Ryan, uh, I, I, it's kind of crossed since we met early, I think back in March, but I just love your, your passion. I love the hands-on approach. I love how everything is integrated. Um, it is, like you say, it's school. And, and, and we need to, we desperately need to readdress and reimagine what school is. So I love, I love everything. Um, I'm not sure. I don't see further questions in the in the chat box. Does anybody else have some questions that um, we can live stream? Susanna yeah. says live stream some of your events. That would that would be Good awesome. Idea. Yeah, it'd be cool. And then or even um, yeah, do some collaboration in there. But yeah, if if we had some some of our events or workshops here, I think it'd be really cool. We, we do very basic stuff so like we started out with just some really cool maker events for the community um i don't know if you heard about but the whole like global cardboard carnival and canes arcade and the idea about uh creating games using just arcades or a cardboard and materials so having our parent company company be in the um furniture business we had tons of cardboard like tractor trailers of it so kids were building castles and stuff but i wonder if something like that we could almost have cameras set up where you guys are doing a cardboard carnival and we're building at the same time. And, and we can kind of have students connect on in the community collect on a global level in terms of building, uh, you know, the same thing, just in different physical locations. And I think with technology nowadays, even the, the other area, you know, we can send data pretty quickly. Um, yeah. It'd be great. Yeah. And Sounds good, that's totally. that's good. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan, I, and I love the comment that you made as well, that you're preparing kids for, it's a career focus. Um, and that's also another whole reimagined education space, hey? uh, just preparing kids for careers and not for a mark or a, an exam or, yeah. Awesome. Yep, exactly. And, and I think, you know, and then I'll kind of, you know, end on this because I think my time's running out, but I think part of it is, um, 
you know, I, I always saw school and, and I was trained in pre-service programs and things like that, that you had to follow state standards and objectives. And, and sometimes I, I never really saw students becoming adults and really, you know, what are they waking up for the rest of their lives now getting excited to do? It was very like narrow minded. And I'm focusing on you as a science student and I need you to get these science scores and then you're moved on to the next grade. I think as educators, we lose sight of what it is. And I think for a lot of the struggling students that I worked with, the sooner you can give them opportunities to really explore what they love and, and find a passion and purpose, they identify like what they need to do then to live that out. So we have some students that we work with, um, you know, that, that are saying, you know, I want to be in hydroponics or I want to be a coder. It's like, okay, well, you know, this is what that job looks like. And this is what you can do to get there. Here are the classes. This is why school now is relevant for you to meet that goal and have that purpose. And if we're not giving them, if we're not giving students those experiences early on, it's very hard for them to understand why they're even in school or what they're going to be doing. So I, I think it's that idea of like, we bring purpose um, for that whole, um, you know, idea about what their career is going to be. And, and we're, we're doing some things with uh, esports as well. Um, this idea about esports space and gaming and how that can engage students. And, and that's been helping students find a lot of passions and allow their passions to connect to a career. And the idea of how many careers come out of uh, uh, the opportunity of esports um, is great. And again, finding those students that have traditionally been overlooked and underserved, um, a way for them to get excited about learning, uh, which has been great. Great. Yep. And the preparing kids for, for that don't exist yet, which is scary. To, I mean, not scary. It's fun. So, I, I, you know, the other part I'll say is I have um, my daughter, my oldest, just started kindergarten. And so it's been an emotional day, an emotional week for my wife and I, but kind of understanding, you know, what she's going to turn into. And, and all of a sudden now school becomes a little bit more important because my own kids are in, in school. And, uh, you know, how are they making the most out of each day and how are they, you know, building relationships and, and going through struggles, the healthy struggles and and, uh, you know, getting excited about what they could do when they get older um, and having them be excited about waking up every day and, and what they're going to do or what they're going to accomplish. So um, that's been a good driver, too. But yes, making school relevant. Uh, yes, Sarah Lee. Yeah, Ryan, um, I can't thank you enough for how you inspire. Um, I hope this, we will journey much further with you. Um, as a country, never mind an organization. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for your time, Ryan. We we appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we'll we'll have conversations further on. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That would be great. Yeah. No, and I really appreciate the opportunity. This is exciting for us to kind of share. Um, and I, uh, you know, maybe one day can visit in person. That would be great. Lovely. <laughs> I'll bring a I'll bring a fork farm. We can start growing lettuce together. Oh, wonderful, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> All right, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Ryan. My, uh, my email's on the website if you have any questions or anything like that. Um, I can also put my email in the chat. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, if you want to follow me there, just kind of engage there. Just please reach out and we'd love to learn uh, how we can help or what you guys are doing, um, especially in different parts of the world. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And we'll get... Um, we'll, we'll get your presentation so that people can, can go through it uh, in their own time and uh, she share and explore a little bit more. Thanks, yep. Ryan. I'll, I'll email it to you, Cheryl, and then anybody can access it for view and Thank you. you whatever you need. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Right. You continue with our program and uh, we've, we've got an, uh, another mastermind in our presence and that is Katrine Stang from the Nelson Mandela University. Uh, Katrine is responsible for professional development program. Uh, for maths teachers, and she heads up the, the math art competition at the Golden Becky Mathematics Development Center. Um, I guess I should put my video on so that you can see who's talking to you. Um, the GMMDC, that's the Golden Becky Center, was commissioned in 2002 by the university specifically to find innovative ways to improve the teaching and learning of mathematics and physical sciences in South African schools and colleges. This national math art competition is a stellar outcome of this early mandate and receives the ongoing proud support of the university. The national math art competition is particular, in particular blazes the trail in Africa for inspiring artistic connections 
with the maths. Um, Karine, welcome, and I will hand the floor to you. Thank you very much. So, yes, so this is great, and good afternoon, everybody. I thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you, Ryan, also for sharing the, what you're doing. This is really inspiring. And yes, I'd love to share with you what we're doing as a South African initiative. Um, let me just get my presentation. Okay, good. Okay, so what we realized a few years ago was that, um, as Cheryl has read, the Universal Mathematics Development Center, and we want to or help learners with mathematics and physical sciences. But just doing maths and physical sciences in a silo, we realized was not enough. So we started with a math art competition. And as soon as we, we talk to people about this, the, the big question that we get asked is, can maths and art be linked? And before I start answering that question, I want to just first stimulate you a little bit with this picture over here. This very controversial t-shirt design, and if you have a look at it, the young inspiring artist, and the artist is crossed out, and there's an written astronaut, and the other, the one on the right, young inspiring artist, crossed out president. And uh, this was a, in 2015, a very controversial t-shirt that was designed by Old Navy, it's a toddler t-shirt. And through the slogan, I think they actually wanted to inspire people to become astronauts, or to think they could become astronauts, or presidents, but what the implication was is people were thinking that artists were inferior to being an astronaut or a president. And this is the thought that I want to leave with you today. Many mathematicians, and I actually used this example at a mathematics conference, many mathematicians wouldn't have nodded to this slogan and said, yes, this is true, and make sure to check that this aspiring youngster who's becoming an astronaut or a president is good at maths too. And unfortunately, many people have this viewpoint that it's either maths or art. But I would like to challenge you today to think a little differently. So this is what, and those of you that have attended some of our workshops will know that this is what we want to challenge people to do, is to look at things differently. Because sometimes what we see is not what we really think we see, because we're either too close, we're not seeing the big picture, we don't see underneath, and we're actually looking for something else. So today I also want to challenge you to, to, to think about maths and art a little differently. And now maths and art is actually not a new idea. Um, this is something that Luca Pacioli, which who was an um, Italian mathematician and a collaborator of Leonardo da Vinci, wrote the book Divina Proportion on, and that was a book on mathematics and art proportion. So big mathematician writing an art book. Albert Durer, who was an artist, wrote several, several maths books on measurement and also on human proportions, because he realized that his, or that his artwork would not nearly be maybe as artistically beautiful if it didn't have the correct proportions. So he realized that as an artist as well, that maths is actually necessary. M.C. Escher, who's such a well-known example of an artist who actually referred to himself later as being a mathematician. And then when I talk about art, um, we don't want to just refer to visual art, but also include music, architecture, and culture. And this whole idea of including all of this was brought to us, first of all, by the Bridges Math Art um, Organization, who's an inter that's a big international organization, and they promote the combination of maths and art. And we were um, at a conference in 2016, I think, where we started grappling with these ideas. Okay, so let's start with what was born out of this whole passion of ours to have people think differently. And this is the maths and the, or the math art competition. So what do you get when you combine maths and art and add a theme to that and then put it to the power of your creativity. Okay, so first of all, just to take a step back, why did we start with this competition? So at our center, we also started joining the international trend towards STEAM. In other words, as Ryan already said, science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. So the old STEM with arts added into it. 
research has shown and um, linked to university. So obviously for us, research is, is quite an important thing to have that as a backing. And the research actually shows that there's a great positive influence of including arts on the performance of learners and the development of the STEM subjects. And then in South Africa, I think maybe worldwide, and this was absolutely emphasized last year with COVID, is that people think, need to think more creatively. And we need innovators, people who will take the challenges and the problems that we have and think about it differently. And to do this, we would like people to explore maths and art in a different way. Now, anybody, I don't know how many of, of you have been, been part of the math art competition, but I know that when we start with it initially, people always say, this is difficult. This is not easy. I'm a math teacher. I really can't draw. So how do I now, where, where do I start? And when you talk to an art teacher um, to, uh, to have or incorporate mathematics, they say, oh, goodness, I, I couldn't do mathematics at school at all. I left it when I could. Or I took maths lit, so I didn't get up really into the maths scene. So it's difficult. It's not easy. But I think once you get into that space, you come out a much richer person. And the responses that we've received since we started this competition has actually motivated and driven us to continue um, the competition throughout even the COVID times last year and this year as well. Just a few reactions of our learners, and this was grade 12 learner from the Eastern Cape. Learners with a more creative way of learning struggle in class because the way mathematics is being taught is rigid and set in the past, which is maybe just a little bit of an accusation towards us as mathematics teachers. Of, by the way, I was a mathematics teacher myself for 25 years before I joined the university again. And at this stage, um, I work now at the Gambeki Center, which is what we call the outreach arm of the maths faculty. So we reach out into the community and reach out to teachers and learners. And then another quote from another learner said, my school, we do not have the opportunity to nurture our skill in the arts design, mechanics and engineering. A lack of resources deprives learners like myself an opportunity to get a head start. So the learners are actually seeing this need to incorporate the creative into mathematics as well. Okay, so just a little bit of background about the competition, but further background, it's an annual competition and it was started for mathematics, or sorry, for South African secondary school learners in 2018. And it's to inspire artistic connections with maths. Oops, sorry, I jumped ahead a bit too quickly. So what do we um, want the learners to do? We want them to create a 2D artwork using maths and art linked to a specific theme. Now, one might say, I said just now about music and all the other art forms, but we also have another alternate motive with this project, and that is also to be able to involve everybody. And that's why, although we grappled quite a lot with what we should use as the framework for the competition, we realized that this was the cheapest and the easiest way to have a whole mass of people enter. Um, right. So what were the goals of the project? We wanted to address the need for a low threshold, non-expensive and an equal access STEAM support program. So as I said already, our center want or had a STEAM drive to include art into these other subjects, but this was seen as a non-expensive and a way in which anybody could take part. We wanted to create or to release creativity and of course to motivate and especially motivate learners with regards to mathematics and science. Another very important thing is we want to bring recognition to learners and teachers, including those from poorer communities and under-resourced schools. A lot of learners, especially those that are often more creative, don't often get recognition in a school, especially if the school doesn't have art as a subject. Then these learners are often marginalized, and not really in the, the, the mainstream of recognition. Whereas we feel that just through this competition, a lot of these learners have actually come to get some recognition from the school or from the friends. And then also a lot of schools who are often not really written in the, 
or often in the newspapers, also get in the newspapers due to some of their learners doing well in that math art competition. We also see the competition as an opportunity for networking, exactly what I'm doing now, chatting to a whole lot of you from all over the country and also to Ryan, who's from the States. So we've, we see this competition as an, a huge opportunity to network with people nationally and internationally. And then finally, one of the goals of the competition is to get people from the maths side of school and from the art um, curriculum side of school to start talking to each other and to start collaborating. So this is one of the exciting outcomes that we've also got with the competition. Here are just a few photographs of some of our winners in the previous year's competitions. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, and you'll see that little masked picture on the top right there, where we had a, a very small award ceremony last year where we, we had to have people in masks, which is not so much fun, but the pictures are from other years that we've had the competition. And we try and invite or stimulate people from all over. Uh, what we've also found another outcome of the competition, which was to us actually something surprising and what we hadn't, or what we necessarily didn't really realize at the beginning was how the competition would shift people's attitudes towards mathematics. So even people who are maybe more musically aligned to really start appreciating how maths and music also um, meet each other or connect. And in this big picture on the screen right now is actually a girl who said that in the maths class, she felt marginalized. She felt that she was ridiculed because people didn't think that she had any talent. But in the maths competition and looking at her artwork, they actually realized that she could, or that they, they, they recognized and they saw her. So she felt that she wasn't being seen, but now she is being seen. We also saw that learners actually have an extreme need for self-expression and learners have a need to express themselves in terms of issues that they, they see around them, issues with regards to global warming, with regards to pollution, with regards to just an issue that's quite contra or quite a, a big thing in South Africa is poaching and rhinos. It opens minds, the learners' minds, to think differently about things. And this is what we, we love about the competition is how learners that don't really get an opportunity to express themselves even in a maths class get this opportunity to do that. It also encourages creativity and learners to take something like just plain graphs, for example, and create something lovely with it. And it gives us the opportunity to interact with learners in workshops and with teachers as well, and to encourage them to become creative. Okay, so to draw back, what is our maths art competition equation? It's maths and art plus the theme. So each year we choose a theme, and then we put that to the power of everybody. And if you, whether you do maths, whether you do maths literacy, it doesn't matter. Anybody from grade seven to grade twelve to produce a math artwork. Okay, there's only one round to our competition, and because we want this to be open and accessible to everybody, the entry is completely free. And we, for the past two years, the entries have been done online through the website. So the first few years, we had the physical artworks posted to Port Elizabeth to our center, which is super, but unfortunately has a lot of logistical problems. So we started with the math art for the, the online entries, which is a and much blessed and decision for last year because we started this fortunately before COVID. And so when COVID started, we were ready and rearing to continue. The competition, as I've already said, is open to any grade 7 to 12 learner in South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland. It's open to public schools, independent schools, home schools, as long as you're a learner or a person in grade 7 to 12 in South Africa, anybody is welcome to enter. This is an annual competition and we run it normally from the 1st of March to the 30th of April, which in a regular year spans the last month of the first term to the first month of the second term. And sorry for everybody who's getting inspired right now, the entries have closed for 2021. Um, this is just a quick view of 
steps that are outlined on the website. And if you want to start preparing your learners for next year, you can start looking at the website and just reading through the steps and the rules and what is necessary. And I can maybe give you a sneak preview that next year's theme is going to be maths art through the sciences. So that we'll put that on the website a little later and have our big launch of the new theme. This year's theme, as you can see here, was beautiful mathematics. So the learners create an artwork, they take a photograph, they enter it into the, the website online form. And then we also want to answer the, them to answer three simple questions. So the first question is, what maths did you use? The second one, how does your artwork show? And now this year, of course, the theme was beautiful mathematics. So we want them to explain to us why Karine, I think you've frozen. Is it just my side? There we go, I see you back. Oh, sorry. Did you lose? Oh dear, okay. <laughs> sorry, I think my internet uh, might be a little unstable. Thank you, Cheryl. Just the end of the last slide, but it's fine. Okay, okay, okay I can quickly go back. All right, there, just maybe the end of the last slide here. The question three here, um, we just said that while your artwork is creative and original, we change that third question every year depending on what the theme is to also link to the theme. Okay, and what we realize is once again that when we do these, or when we promote the competition, often people really battle to link the two together. So we have workshops and we've done workshops all over the country this year. And last year we were a bit stumped with regards to moving around freely, but I did manage to do two workshops in the Limpopo area this year as well. So we're always open to doing that. Judging of the artworks, the next step is always done by a transdisciplinary team. So we try and involve architecture, art, mathematics, um, uh, education, People from all over, we invite our lecturers, we invite NGOs, we invite STEAM specialists, we invite everybody to be part of this transdisciplinary team in judging the artworks. Both the artwork and the written work, those, of course, those answered questions are considered by the judges. And then the artistic technique and the correct use of English is not scored. So when learners enter their questions, we often take the questions and correct a little bit of English grammar here and there so as not to distract to the actual intention of what they were writing. And then of course the artistic technique, we always ask the judges not to take that into account because we want the playing field to be level. We want creativity to be scored and not art technique necessarily. So creativity and connecting that to art, that is what's more important. Um, we always try and pre-COVID, we had more opportunities, of course, to exhibit the artworks. Pre-COVID, we had often had provincial prize givings and national prize givings if the amount of entries from the provinces um, merited a provincial prize giving, then we could do that. The national prize giving always done in Port Elizabeth at the Net well, for the past few years, the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum, which is a super space here in Port Elizabeth. And then we also try and exhibit these artworks, the top artworks at conferences nationally and internationally. So we've in exhibited these artworks at the Bridges Math Art Conferences, at the Open Design Festival in Cape Town, the Berlin Wall Science Festival in Germany. And as soon as we get an opportunity to do that as well. This year over Zoom, we've had quite a few opportunities. Last week, we actually shared some of our artworks with a group from Indonesia few weeks before that with groups from India. And so we've had uh, Zoom conferences all over the world in which we've promoted our art competition and the artworks of, and talent of our South African learners. We also have an annual calendar to showcase the artworks. And before I close off, I just want to quickly go through just to show you what the artworks are, look like, a selection of the artworks through the years. So in 2018, 
Our topic was any application of maths and art. And these were some of the artworks that we received back, which linked just maths and art. In 2019, we had a specific topic of the learners had to interpret either maths in nature or maths in man-made designs. And we were blown away by, by the talent of our South African learners. Here are just a few of the artworks. Um, you can always see that in nature, the hexagonal shape and bees obviously are a great topic and theme to work with, but also the symmetry in butterflies, etc. And then in man-made designs, the symmetry in dance. And of course, a lot of cultural symbols, even the symmetry and the mathematics linked to our bodies and the makeup of our bodies. Here are a few more examples, lovely examples, creating maths and art. And then in 2020, our topic was my universe and the learners could interpret this any way they wanted to. In other words, my universe as in space or my universe such as in the school where I'm in or my universe such as my mind or my inner thinking. And here are just a few examples. For example, one learner here took up the challenge. She's a sports girl and you can see that her universe consisted of making her muscles strong. And then we also had a lovely artwork here, pencil artwork, where a learner described their universe and space. And here is another example, the learner also showing her universe inside her maths class, music, all the other items that learner had in their universe, describing those. And just a few more examples of the interpretation of the learners of the universe. And then finally, this year, beautiful mathematics. And I see that there are some of the Penland teachers on this um, Zoom as well. They might recognize some of their artworks here in the next few slides. So these were the artworks representing beautiful mathematics. So what learners interpreted as being beautiful mathematics? Um, just interestingly enough, we had quite a few this year of learners who also linked the artworks to the, the pandemic. Sorry, let me just go back there. Oh, dear. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I wanted to scoot through too quickly. Um, the pandemic and this one over here where the learner actually looked at the how they, they used maths to keep themselves sane during the pandemic. So it was a lovely interpretation of that. And here are a few more beautiful interpretations of where maths is also used to create beauty. Beauty, for example, in the skyline of a city in a museum such as the Louvre Museum, and then also in the different natural environments. Here are a few more examples of maths and beauty, in fractals, fractal beauty or fractal maths, and um, synchronization in maths. And then also tessellations. And that is it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm open for questions and then also comments if there are any. Thank you very much. I hope I'm still within my time, Cheryl. I haven't been <laughs> keeping an eye on the clock. Yeah, you are. What did is just going to do some of the questions? Um, yeah, that was that was really beautiful. The presentation was amazing i don't believe actually students made this beautiful art pieces <laughs> um so we have a question from um Andilia. Uh, i mm -hmm. usually call him mr a so it's kind of weird um he's asking what's your approach and support to taking the maths art competition to the grassroots like when you're collaborating with ngos across the country and in bumalang in particular he's just asking Thank you, Andile. That's a very good question. And yes, so what I'm doing today is one of the ways in reaching out to NGOs. So every year, we, we often have a very strong um, focus on trying to involve the education departments and then also reaching out to the schools directly and to try and get them involved. And as soon as we have connections with an NGO, we reach out to them as well. For example, um, in the, the Mpumalanga region, we've actually recently joined also with the Science Expo 
um, group and they are next year also going to help us promote but if or promote the competition in especially in Pumalanga and in some of the other provinces but yes if if in any way anybody would like to reach out to me and you're part of an NGO wanting to to um, involve students or teachers that are in your projects, please reach out to me. Um, the our website address, www.mathart.coza, is where you'll find some information. And then just very simply, and I'll put that in the chat now as well, our, we have a special dedicated math art email address at the Nelson Mandela University. It's just simply mathart at mandela.ac.za, AC because we're an academic institution in South Africa. So if you pop us a message and your contact details, we'll reach out to you there. Awesome, that's beautiful. Um, he's also asking, um, how do you get the maths and art departments in schools and curriculum advisors to think differently about collaborating while busy chasing their curricula, curriculum, sorry, to like the CAPS compliance. That is always the challenge. And as I said, just the, the actual collaboration of maths and art is, is a challenge to a lot of people. So what we try and do is just stimulate them. Most of the schools take this on as a project that they do in their arts and culture classes in grade eight and nine. So we've actually had a lot of very big cohort of, of increase in maths and art. And um, just now, Ryan, you were mentioning all the different acronyms of STEAM. So across the country, there are many other schools and also some of the departments. Western Cape is one of them who've actually taken up this STEAM approach and they just added their own bit to it at the end, agriculture and coding, so STEMAC. And they also promoted through their arts and culture departments that actually promoted the math art competition in the Western Cape last year and try to encourage the schools um, and there's those learners to take part in the competition. So that was one of the, that's one of the ways that we try and, in, and, and include them. But of course, we don't want this to be an arts and culture project. We want the two disciplines to talk to each other. So that's why the, the, the other questions, so there must be some explanation of maths and hopefully then we actually have the people collaborating and talking, even if it's just on an informal basis in the staff room, asking advice in how to do that. Are there any other questions? Awesome. I, I don't think so. I don't look into my chat box and I don't think there's any more questions for you. But yeah, it looks, it looks like there's no more questions. It's a great presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just see another. And then he says, Thank you. Thank you to the first and second name, confused Ryan Anthony from Fluxon, <laughs> Katrine Stain from NMU, NMU, for two invigorating presentations. Thank you. Okay, uh, Katrine, thank you. Oh, Karine, thank you so much for your time that you, you've, you've given us today. Uh, uh, doesn't STEAM inspire everybody? I just, I just, when you listen to the whole approach of STEAM and, and how it inspires learning, the love of learning and the integration and the breaking down of the silos, the subject silos, bringing it all together just to make learning fun. Um, yeah, uh, amazing. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And I do, um, you will definitely hear from us. We will be reaching from Pumalanga and reaching out and, and getting us more involved. I know Penryn is involved with the maths art competition, and we're going to get Pen Reach involved too. So uh, watch this space next year. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you to you, Karine. Really appreciate it. So to everybody, um, thank you for being with us today. Uh, it is so inspiring. My mind is racing with ideas and, and ways we can just make learning more fun. Um, yeah. 
um, if and and then just as we close off, we will share um, our notes on uh, on social media and our different platforms. Um, our next thing cop is in October um, to end off the year, and it's it's wonderful to see how this community is growing, how um, we we sharing with our ideas. Um, how we're breaking down the whole concept of what is STEAM. And, and as we've heard over and over again, it's just, it's school. It's reimagining school. And uh, so exciting. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, Brian, it's good to see you still here. <laughs> but we might have lost you. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's it. So from from Penridge, uh, we we thank one and all for being here. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your uh, passion, um, and we invite um, all those that want to to continue with the space with us. Uh, anyone that's wanting to share their thoughts on the concept of STEAM, you're very welcome to pop us. Um, reach out to other Benson from from Bridge or myself um, from Penridge and and let's collaborate let's let's join hands and, and make this space more exciting so I don't know if there's any more closing comments lots of messages coming through on the chat box so maybe I can just from my side say thank you to you Cheryl and then the people from Bridge as well I think it's an awesome um, this community of practice is an awesome initiative and I really wish you that, that your, your, it will increase and grow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, that's it. We are over and out. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.